Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ Happening Live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. And the praying people of God said, yeah. I welcome all of Ajigunle to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Yeah. Always wonderful to be in Ajigunle. We were here last week and here we are again. Double blessing for everyone in Jesus' name. The Lord will touch your life. I'll touch your family and everything shakeable in that life the Lord will shake it out and then he'll establish the blessing of God in your life once again welcome in Jesus name let's pray together father we thank you for our bible study thank you for your children thank you for our ministers thank you for our workers thank you for our members and thank you for the invitees we pray tonight to enlighten everyone in your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that we'll be doers of the word. We'll not be hearers only. The grace and the strength and the energy to carry out the word, give to every one of your children in Jesus' name. Lead us into deeper things in the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And somebody said... Amen. God bless you. We're coming to John chapter 4. And as we come to John chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 31. John chapter 4, verse 31. In the meantime, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have me to eat, that she know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, as any man brought him or to eat, look at verse 34, Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. As you look at those verses today, it's a continuation of what we studied before. We had learned in the word of God before that Jesus Christ went with his disciples and he came to this well by Samaria in the city of Sychar. As you come to chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4. It says, He must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, thus, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And then we're told the woman came, but look at verse 8, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. All through that time that Jesus Christ was talking, discussing with the woman, the disciples were not around. They had gone to buy food. And Jesus was hungry, Jesus was tired, Jesus was weary, and Jesus was thirsty. And you will think that now the best thing would be for him to eat and to drink. Because the disciples came now, and they came with the food. And it was saying, Master, eat. 
And then he was telling them, I have food to eat that you know not of. And he began to wonder naturally like you would wonder if you were there. As somebody brought him food, as somebody gave him, giving him water, as somebody ministered to his need, as he been refreshed because somebody administered to him. And then Jesus told them, there's a kind of food you don't understand. There's a kind of meal you don't understand. And there is a kind of nourishment and satisfaction you do not understand that I have got. And now, as said, the disciples came, they were very slow in understanding. Just like that woman by the well was slow herself in understanding. They too, they were slow in understanding. And now he told them in verse 34, come back to chapter 4, verse 34, verse 34 Jesus says unto them, my meat, my food, the thing that refreshes me, and the thing that fills me up, and the things that excites me and gives me inner energy and inner drive is this. It is to do the will of him that sent me. I recognize that every time. I am a saint man. I'm the saint savior. I'm the commissioned savior. And as I look at what he has sent me to do, and I'm doing that, he said that brings satisfaction. And that brings joy. And that brings contentment. And that fills me up and replaces the food you think I would have eaten. And then it says, it's not only to do his will, but to finish his work. This passage then they were looking at today gives us the detail of the consequence of the discussion of the Lord Jesus Christ with the Samaritan woman. It also goes on to tell us the conclusion of the whole story. Because eventually, all those Samaritans came, and as they came, he began to teach them the word of God, and they realized that Jesus Christ was the Savior. Jesus Christ was the Lord, and Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And he even told the woman at the end of the whole story, we're coming back now to chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 42. Verse 42, and said unto the woman, now we believe, you will believe tonight. You believe all there is to believe about Jesus Christ, it will turn your life around. It will change your life, it will transform you even this night and permanently forever in Jesus' name. Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and we know that this is indeed the christ the savior of the world i want you to understand the gradual way in which the light don't on them i want you to understand that the steps that had been taken if you remember about the woman that was studied already when he saw jesus christ when she saw jesus christ she didn't understand that this was the messiah this was the christ he first of all said you are a man and then said, you are a Jew. How is it you are asking water of me? Eventually, she went ahead and said, sir, a kind of respect and honor that it appears that you know what I don't know. And then went beyond sir and said, you are a prophet. Are you a prophet? And then asked a question and then said, okay, when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said, he that speaketh unto you, I am he. You'll see gradually, gradually how the Lord led her. And that's what happens to everybody. When you first came to the church, you need to understand everything you understand now about salvation, gradual, about sanctification, gradual, about holiness, gradual, about righteousness, gradual, about how you need to make right your life, restitution, gradual, about your victory, victory in the Lord, and dominion in Christ gradual and thank God we're not babies anymore and thank God we're growing and so that woman with the conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ with that conversation number one there's a conviction the Lord began to lead her day after uh, that is a uh, word after word precept from precept and from that conviction confession came and she confessed who she was and she confessed her life to the Lord Jesus Christ and she didn't stop there you see there are people once the light begins to dawn on them and there's a little understanding and there's conviction there's confession they think that's the end of it but the woman came onto conversion she was converted eventually she left her water but it changed had come. 
a transformation had come. And that same change will happen to you even tonight in Jesus' name. And no matter at what level you are, you are at this level, the Lord will take you a bit higher. And you are at a higher level, the Lord will take you higher still. Every time you come in the presence of the Lord, there's always a higher step a higher level and a higher experience that you're going to have. That's how the encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how he does good in your life. And eventually from that conversion to consecration, she consecrated everything to the Lord and said, that's my water pot. And then went to the city and said, come see a man that told me everything that I ever did is not this the Christ. And then she brought them to the Lord. She became fruitful you are going to be fruitful. That's why we're looking at this uh, passage tonight that as you realize that you come to learn about Jesus Christ, you want to know more about him. And as he teaches you more and leads you more and guides you more, you have that conclusion by yourself. And then the people that came to see Jesus Christ he said, he should tell you with them. And he remained with them about two days. At the end of the two days, they too, they went beyond, is my savior. Yes, is my savior. Yes, is a personal savior. He saves the individual. Then is the savior of our city. But he goes beyond that. Is the savior of our nation. They came to the conclusion, now we believe. Not just because of your word. We have heard him ourselves. And we know that this is the savior of tell me out loud of the world of the world as they grow in understanding and you grow in understanding will come to understand it's not just a local a savior somewhere it's not a savior of a community somewhere or just of one country is a savior of the world tonight we're looking at the passage of scripture from verse 31 all through to verse 42 christ consuming passion for sinners salvation Christ's consuming passion for sinners' salvation. We're going to divide the passage to three parts. Number one, the slow comprehension of the spiritual. The slow comprehension of the spiritual. You see, spiritual things, they do not come all of a sudden to everybody. Just like this woman, the spiritual. When Jesus was talking of living water, she didn't fully understand. She said, I want to drink that water, but she still had limited understanding standing and the disciples too as jesus spoke about the spiritual meal and the spiritual food and the spiritual satisfaction and the spiritual refreshing didn't he fully understand but little by little by little eventually they came to understand just like you are going to understand better tonight and the lord will take us from that slow understanding and will have a sure understanding in jesus name point number one uh, the slow comprehension of the spiritual point number two number two is the stirring commission for his servants the commission that stirs you up the commission that excites you the commission that puts you on fire the commission that sets motion in your feet and the commission that drives you out of a local place and then you go to the town and then you come to tell everybody come see the man that told me everything that i ever did the man that came to my life and changed my life and turned me around is this not the christ and then you realize that this is the christ this christ will save every soul the soul that will call upon the Lord will transform the soul. The soul that will call upon the Lord and will change you and turn you around. You'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. The stirring commission for his servants. Point number three, the Samaritan's conversion by the Savior. All those Samaritans, how the grace of God came to their lives and the grace to realize they were sinners. The grace to realize they couldn't save themselves. The grace to realize their tradition couldn't save them. Their self-righteousness couldn't save them. And their worship, vain worship could not save them. But that Jesus and Jesus only was the one to come to them and to save them. And they realized they had the personal salvation. And they knew that their salvation was not available only for Samaria, or Samaria or for Israel. But even for the rest of the world. The Samaritan's conversion 
by the Savior. Point number one. What's number one on your notes over there? The slow comprehension of the spiritual. We're coming back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 31. It says in verse 31 in the meantime. While his disciples prayed him saying. Master eat. They had concern. They had compassion. And they had uh, the care of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he had not eaten. And they had gone to the city. And they had bought the food. Now they brought the food. And you understand understand that it was just as Jesus Christ was finishing talking to the woman and was uh, rounding up everything that he came and the woman had now gone and led the water pot there and they were wondering is there somebody brought him something to eat in verse 32 but he said unto them I have meat to eat that she know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, as any man, any one, man or woman, anyone brought him out to eat, and Jesus to open their understanding and to expand their comprehension and to give them the knowledge of the truth concerning himself and concerning anyone that has a zeal to serve the Lord, a commitment to serve the Lord, he now told them in verse 34, Jesus says unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. We're looking at uh, this uh, section. The disciples were so slow in understanding Christ's vision. They need to understand the vision of Christ or Christ's passion. They need to understand the passion of Christ. They need to understand the satisfaction of Christ. The sin that gave him satisfaction. They need to understand the concern of Christ. They need to understand the purpose of Christ or the pursuit of Christ or his singleness of heart. They need to understand his life's priority. As you come to the Lord, maybe when you were born again, you still did not understand the concern of the Lord. You need to understand the vision of the Lord. Even now that you say you are saved, you are sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, how much of the vision of the Lord do you understand? You know what the Bible says? Where there's no vision, the people perish. And if you don't understand, that same vision in the mind of Christ. Your life will be going this direction and Christ's vision will be going the other direction. Other people do not understand what passion is all about. What fire is all about what flame is all about and what revival is all about and what inner thirst inner thirst is all about but Jesus Christ had that passion immediately he saw that a woman he said this will need salvation in fact that's what the Bible says he must needs go through Samaria and the same thing with you the more you get closer to Christ the more you know Christ the more you'll understand his vision his passion and his satisfaction when he said, I have meat to eat, meat to eat, what satisfies me, what fills me up, and what gives me joy, and what gives me contentment. And I have that, and you don't know about that. And when they were wondering what that was, he said, the will of my father and the work of my father. He says, once I'm involved in that, that fills me up. Understand, he wasn't talking to a crowd in Jerusalem. He wasn't talking to a crowd in Nazareth. He wasn't talking to a crowd in Capernaum. He was talking to an individual just this one single soul the passion he had for the salvation of that single soul he said that satisfies me and the very joy to see that woman coming out of conviction out of confession and coming to conversion and getting to consecration he said this is a satisfaction this is what makes life worth living the same thing with you as you get closer to the Lord then you see the concern of the Lord for souls and in your community here you see all those uh, people run going here and going there almost every seat in your community here you find people and people and people and if you do not have uh, 
the concern of Christ. You just pass by them. You don't think about anything. You pass by them. You might think of business. You might think of trade. You might think of market. But when Jesus saw multitudes like that, his uh, concern was for their salvation. And when he gives to his own heart, have the mind of Christ in you. When you have the mind of Christ in you and the heart of Christ in you, that concern will come into your heart. The purpose of life will come into the pursuit that he had. He was there and he knew. He looked at them. In fact, he told them, they said, look on the fields. They are white already for harvest. He could see all those Samaritans coming. They thought it wasn't time yet, but he said, it is time. And for you now, it is time. Time to evangelize and time to tell other people and time to show them the way of the Lord and to show them the way of salvation. You'll have this same singleness of heart that Jesus Christ had in Jesus' name. He had life's priority. This is the one thing that must be done. That's why he told Martha. He said, Martha, Martha, you're combined about with many things, but one thing is necessary. One thing is needful. And Jesus saw that when those disciples came and he thought, you know, he must eat, he must have this, he must have that. He said, one thing is important and one thing fills me up and this is my meat and this is my nourishment. Even the will of my father who sent me and the work of God. And let's look at this again. I'm looking at verse 32. It says, but he says unto them, I have meat to eat that she know not of. I have meat to eat that she know not of. You know what that means? It says, it is a priority in my life. It's something number one in my life. For as for the food, that's not number one. There are people in this life, whatever they, you know, what they're going to eat, what man must eat for them, that's number one. Where man will live for them, that's number one. The clothes man will wear for them, that's number one. But Jesus said, there's something that comes number one, uppermost in my heart, uppermost in my life. Let me show you something. We're looking at Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. Here is the chief servant of uh, Abraham. He had gone out because he was on an errand. He had a commission. And the commission was to find a wife for Isaac. And then eventually he got there. You might have read the story before. But the point I want to make for you is this. Look at verse 33. In uh, Genesis chapter 24, verse 33. And there was set meat before him to eat. But he said... I will not eat until I have told mine errand. And, the, and he said, speak on. You know what happened over here? He's been coming on a long, long journey. He was thirsty. And he was hungry. And the people were so hospitable. When he got there, they said food before him. They said, first of all, you are going to eat. He said, no, I don't want to eat now. I'm not hungry now. I should have been hungry. But it's a priority of my life. There's a concern in my life. The errand that my master had sent me to accomplish. That's the number one in my life. It's like the language of Jesus Christ. I have me to eat that she know not of. The same thing if you're a child of God. You might be hungry. You might be thirsty. You might be jobless. You might not have this or that. But then you say, that's not number one. Number one is the will of my father. And the will of your father is that you will do the work he has sent you to do. You will do it. I said you will do it. We're looking at Job chapter 23, Job chapter 23, and I'm reading here from verse 12, Job chapter 23, and we're looking at verse 12. You see the language of another person. These are people that really knew the Lord. And if you want to know whether you know the Lord or not, if you want to know whether you are converted or not, if you want to know whether you are committed to the Lord or not, if you want to know whether you have the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ or not, this is how to compare. And this is what to see. And to say, am I like that? Or is food number one in my life? Marriage, number one in my life. Job, number one in my life. Accommodation, number one in my life. Healing, number one in my life. Or do I make the priority of my life, doing the will of my father, and doing the work of God? Job, chapter, tell me. 
chapter 23, and I'm reading from verse 12. It says, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. Look at that. Look at that. All that happened to Job, you would have thought that man would be discouraged. You would have thought that man would backslide. You would have thought that man will say, why am I serving God? If I'm serving God and this happened to my children, if I'm serving God and this happened to my business, if I'm serving God and this happened to all those uh, camels and all those, uh, you know, the first stocks that I have, why am I serving God? He said, no, whatever has happened, my number one priority in life is to keep on serving the Lord. I'm talking about you. Your number one priority will be to serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his leaves. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my, tell me, necessary food. Necessary food, breakfast, necessary food. You know, there are people that, uh, you know, the, the service is uh, to be at 8 o'clock and uh, their wife had not uh, finished uh, the breakfast by 7.30. And they say, uh, maybe I'll not go to service today because uh, I know my stomach and I know my body. If I don't eat today, how can I go to the service? And, uh, you know, eventually they, you know, stay back there and they stop themselves with this and then they say, but, uh, you know, the boss has gone every Everything is gone now. They're not like Job. They're not like the people that will say, here is what I esteem as number one, priority of my life. And they're not like Jesus Christ that will forsake all that meal and forsake everything and say, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Now come back to John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 34 now. It says, Jesus said unto them, as he said unto them, he's saying unto you, and he's saying unto me, and he's saying unto us, he says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Two things there, number one, to do the will of him that sent me. And then you begin to ask yourself, what's that will? What's that will? The will of the Father who had sent him. I'm looking at John chapter 5 verse 30. So you will see the concentration of his life. So you will see the consecration of his life. So you will see the commitment of his life. We're looking at uh, John chapter 5 uh, and we're reading from verse 30. To do the will of him that sent me. It says, I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not, tell me, my own will, but the will of the Father which have sent me. You see that? There are many people, they're full of themselves. They're full of their own will. They're full of their own errand. They're full of their own goals. They're full of their own dream. They're full of their own business. I must make this. I must make this. So and so, my partner has made that. I must make this. So and so has traveled to Japan, has traveled to um, whatever, South Africa, has traveled to, you know, Europe, and because they have gone, I too must go. They do not understand. They do not have the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not your will. It's not what you desire. It's not what so and so has done. It's not what such and such has done. It is the will of God in your life that matters. And so Jesus said, of my own self, I can do nothing. Of my own dream, I have nothing. Of my own vision, I have nothing. Of my own business, nothing like that. But I will do the will of him that sent me. And then he says he'll finish the work. Look at chapter 6. We're looking at John chapter 6, verse 38. What's that will? The will of my father. Here is it. Chapter 6 and verse 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. I pray that will become your confession. That will become your commitment. You know, once some things happen, there'll be, you know, what uh, human will will likely be. And, uh, you know, something has happened, like job, like money, like market, and all that. There is the will of the man. And the wheel of society. And what they said you would like to see you have. But if you are telling them every time. And you are telling yourself every time. I came down from heaven. Not to do my own will. But the will of him that sent me. What's the will? Verse 39. And this is the father's will. Which has sent me. 
that all which he has given me, I should lose nothing and should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone, everyone that sees the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. Every time Jesus saw anyone, he then he reminded himself, the will of my father is that this one should be saved. The will of my father is that this one should have everlasting life. The will of my father is that this one should be converted. Every time you meet somebody, if the mind of Christ is in you, if the heart of Christ is in you, if the goal and the dream of Christ is in you, every time you see a friend, every time you see a neighbor, every time you see anyone, you say, the will of my father is is that days will not perish. Is that days will repent. Is that days will turn to the Lord. And maybe nobody else is talking to him. Nobody else is talking to her. About eternal life. About salvation. You'll open your mouth. You'll say, Lord, help me. I'm not going to talk on any other thing. This is number one. The salvation of this soul. This is number one. The repentance of this person. So that this person will not perish. That's the will of the Father. And I pray that that will of the Father Father, will be done in your life in Jesus' name. Come back to chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And to finish his work. But the point is, if you never start the work, how do you finish what you have not started? If you are not committed to the work, if you do it haphazardly, sometimes when you hear about track distribution, then you rise up because the fire is burning. Then after you've done it on that Sunday, then you drop everything. You know? Have you given those tracks to everybody in your community, everybody in your local government, everybody in your region, in your state, everybody in the country? You cannot stop. You want to keep on doing it until you finish the work. You'll get started you'll be committed. And you're going to continue till the very end in Jesus' name. He said, I will do the work and then I will finish it. Look at this, chapter 9 of John. John chapter 9 and I'm reading from verse 4. John chapter 9, verse 4. It says, I must work the works of him that sent me. You see, society would like to lay some works on you, some responsibilities on you. your family, extended family, would like to lay some responsibility on you. You're a businessman. You've gone to the city. You've gone to the capital. And you've gone to Lagos. You've gone here and there. What are you bringing back? And the responsibility they are giving you is you must build a house here. You must establish a company here. You must establish this one here. And you forget the father who sent you to this world. And he said, whatever society is seeing, whatever your family is seeing, whatever extended people, whatever they are seeing, and whatever the political class may be telling you, calling you, come on here. Is it church that has taken away your heart? You're a good candidate. You are there and you are that and they want to give you work to do that to occupy the rest of your life and then your life eventually becomes meaningless but to say no I'm looking at my heavenly father he has given me some work to do and that work he has given me I will finish in Jesus name Amen. I see somebody there, you know, you're in the office and a uh, Saturday workers meeting is going on. Say, I would have been there. But you know, uh, this business, I must finish this. I must finish this. Your mind is not on the work of the Lord. Your mind is not on the work. He has committed to your hand. It says, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. I'm coming to John chapter 17 verse 4. John chapter 17 verse 4. It says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work. Look at that. Look at that. He was monitoring himself. He was gauging everything. He was evaluating everything. He was saying, I've reached that city. 
I've reached that community. I've reached that tribe. I've reached those uh, community people there. And now by the time he came to chapter 17, uh, he was talking to the Heavenly Father. He said, yes, I never missed a day. I never missed a week. I knew you brought me here. You sent me here for something. And he says, I have finished. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And I pray that the same thing will be said about you in Jesus' name. Do you know he has given you a work to do? I said, you know, he has given you a work to do. Okay, let me show you. We're looking at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 34. Mark chapter 13. We're reading from verse 34. Mark 13. And we're reading from verse 34. In verse 34, hear what it says over here. But the son of man is a semantic in a fat journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to tell me and to tell me out loud every man is work and commanded the potter to watch. He gave to every man, if you are a child of God, he's giving you something to do. Go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye and teach them, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. He gave every man his work that he must do. And Jesus said, I have finished. You'll keep on until you're finished. You'll be faithful until you finish. And then look at uh, chapter 17. We're looking at that John chapter 17. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read that uh, verse 4 again. It says, I have glorified thee on the earth. You ask yourself, your office, are you glorifying the Lord? Your family, are you glorifying the Lord? When you visit home, in your village, are you glorifying the Lord? The things you do, the things you say, and the things you get involved with. Do you have Christ and do you have the Lord at the center of your focus every time? That although I'm here, I'm among my people, I still have to glorify the Lord. And then Jesus said, I finished the work without givest me to do. Come to verse 18. In verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. The Lord now transferred that same assignment unto them. The Lord transferred that same commitment unto them. You sent me, I've been faithful and I've finished the work. I'm now handing over to my disciples. If you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus, he's telling you the same thing here. Thank God I'm a disciple. I say thank God I'm a disciple. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And he said, as my father has sent me into the world, even so have I also sent you into the world. You will do the work. You will succeed. This work of God will prosper in your hands in Jesus' name. He told his own disciples, he said, the father sent me and I I'm sending you in that same way. We're looking at a John chapter. We're looking at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 21. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Be peace be in your heart and be in your family. All the confusion and the conflict, the Lord will drive away in Jesus' name. And then he said in verse 21, As my Father has sent me, even so have I also sent you into the world. Sent you into the world. And then eventually we're coming to chapter 19, verse 30. Chapter 19, we're looking at verse 30. He was now on the cross of Calvary. He died to bear our sin, our shame, our suffering. And just before he yielded up, he gave up the ghost. Look at what he said. Chapter 19 verse 30. This was the last moment of his life. The last breath that he breathed. And the last minute that he lived here. From the very beginning, on and on and on, he had been looking at his life. I'm committed to the work he has given me to do. And I will continue and continue until I finish. Look at this now in verse 30. Then Jesus therefore, and when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, tell me, 
Tell me out loud. Oh, hold on, hold on. You know, Jesus Christ was on the cross of Calvary. He was hanging there and suffering and bleeding. A crown of thorns on the head. And then the nails on the hand. And the nails on the feet. And there was a thief on the cross by his side that said, Lord, remember me when you come to the kingdom. And Jesus didn't say, ah, look at me. I'm suffering now. I don't remember that now. But at that time, when he was at the height of suffering, he still remember the work that God had given him to do. And he said, today that will be with me in paradise, even at the cross there. And when he had said that, he now said, it is finished. And he bowed, he said, and gave up the ghost. I pray you'll continue until you finish. You know, some people, they have a little bit of headache. And if it were to, if it were on the ordinary day to go to the market, they'll carry that headache and go to their business and go to the market. But when it comes to evangelization, it comes to, to, to following up people, it comes to talking to people to get to heaven and to get out of sin and become a believer, I have a little headache. If some people are hungry a little bit, they cannot continue the work the Lord had given them to do. But if, if they are hungry and there is, you know, they have an appointment for business or they want to go and take visa uh, to go to Japan, go here and there, they will go for that visa even though they have that hunger, even though they have that challenge. But when it comes to working for the Lord, that's the time they have, you know, I don't know, I can't turn my neck. I don't know what's happening to my neck. I don't know what's happening. Uh, this my uncle is paying me. It doesn't pay them when it's for market. Things will change from today. All those excuse excuses, we're going to get rid of them in Jesus' name. And the very passion of Christ and the very life of Christ will enter into every one of us in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at the stirring commission for his servants. The stirring commission for his servants. We're coming to uh, John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 35. John chapter 4 verse 35 say not ye that are yet four months and then cometh harvest behold I say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest look at what Jesus Christ was talking to the disciples you know why I was telling them this look up here let me tell you their story they went to the uh, city they went to buy bread while they went to the city to buy bread, they saw many of those Samaritans. None of them opened their mouths to tell any Samaritan that uh, they ought to give their lives to Christ. Jesus Christ was at the gate of their city. And the people did not know. And these disciples went out. They were telling themselves, not yet time. Not yet time. Maybe they will believe later, but not yet time. That's what Jesus was telling them. He said, disciples. What did I tell you when I called you? I told you, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And then you're saying, not time yet, not time yet. That's why he told them, say ye not. Are you not telling yourselves as you are talking, John talking to James, and Peter talking to Andrew, and Matthew talking to Bartholomew, that's well, can we talk to these people? Can we tell them? Oh, no, we came to buy food. And since we came to buy food for the master and is waiting for us, let's do, let's give ourselves to what assignment he has given us. He's waiting for the food we're bought. And so all these people are not talk to them. That's what Jesus said. Are you not saying, are you not telling yourselves that it is uh, not time yet, there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. Then he said, behold, behold. Why did he say that? The woman had gone to the city and the woman had started telling them, come see a man that told me everything that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And the people were coming. The people were coming. And while they were coming, Jesus said, look up, look up, look at them. They are coming because it is time for them to be reaped into the kingdom. That's why I said, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. It's talking about spiritual. I, don't, I think 
I hope you are not thinking about the field of wheat and the field of corn and the field of rice. It's talking about the field to be evangelized. It's talking about the people that should be invested into the kingdom. It says, for they are white already to harvest. Look at verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages. If you get up, you and you begin to do it you receive wages and then you gather fruit unto life eternal you know it's talking about something spiritual there it's talking about the sinners the samaritans that are already coming and they'll be gathered and garnered and kept in the barn and kept unto eternal life that both he that soweth and he that tripeth may rejoice together. It's talking about two kinds of uh, work there. The people that sow, the people that reap. The people that do the initial work and they sow the seed of the word of God in the lives of the people. Then there are those who will come in and finalize it and bring them to the Lord. Look at verse 36. And it says, uh, he that tripeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that both he that sow and he that tripeth may rejoice together. You remember what Paul the Apostle said about Apollos? He said, Apollos, you know, planted, Apollos watered, but both of us were working for the Lord. One is sowing, the other one is reaping. We're doing the same work of the Lord. We're not competing with each other. We're complementing each other. We're supporting each other. The thing you have not finished, I finish it up. The thing I have not finished, you finish it up. There's no competition. There's no competition. Conflict, and there's no strife and there's no fighting and because we're doing the same thing you have a goal the soul should be saved I have a goal the soul should be saved your part is to prepare them so that they can be saved and my part is to bring the word of God so they can be saved one is sowing and the other one is reaping and we're rejoicing together look at verse 37 herein is the saying true one soweth and another reapeth look at verse 38 I sent you to reap whereon thou bestowed no labor. I sent you to reap whereon thou bestowed no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. How do you understand that? You know what Jesus was saying? Look up here for a moment. You know that woman of Samaria, when she was talking to Jesus, she said, okay, I know that Messiah cometh, which is the Christ. How did she know that? Somebody had sowed the weed, the word of God in her heart that there's somebody coming. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. And she accepted that already. And she said, okay, I'm asking a question now. You may not be able to answer me, but something I know. They have taught me. Somebody had taught me. Somebody had labored and had planted that in me that Christ is coming. And when he comes, he knows all things. He will tell us all things. Already he had that knowledge before Jesus Christ even met, him, met her. That's why Jesus now said, I that speaketh unto thee, tell me, I am he. Because Jesus now finalized it, and then the woman became saved. And when the woman went to the city, the woman said, come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? They knew the vocabulary. They knew the name that there's somebody that is called the Christ. Only they had not seen him. Only they had not come a face to face with them. Somebody else had already labored, had sowed that word into them that Christ is coming. And all she had to do is that that person we've been looking for. That person we're talking about, that Christ is coming, I have seen him. And he told me everything I did. Come and find out for yourself. It's not this, the Christ. That, that's what the Lord was saying. He's saying, when you go out to witness, you're not totally, you're not totally new. They're not totally new to what you're saying. Huh? You're talking to somebody and you mention Jesus. You say, uh-huh, I've heard about Jesus. You say, hey, there's Bible. Yeah, I even have a copy of the Bible. Some people have labored and they translated from the Greek. 
Greek and the Hebrew into English. And some people have labored. They've translated it already into our local language. Some people have labored. And even some of the songs were singing. They have even been singing those songs. And there are some people have labored. And they have emphasized that Sunday is the time we we'll worship the Lord. And they go to church before you even saw them, before you knew them. And, uh, you know, they know about heaven. They know about hell. All that remains now is that you will reap because it had been sown in their heart. That's what Jesus is saying. He said other people have labored. Other people were faithful and they sowed the seed of the word into their hearts. And you need to finalize everything now. You will do it. I said you will do it. Uh, you know, as Paul went to the synagogue, already the people, they had synagogue, the people at the Old Testament, the people knew that Christ was to come. All he will do now is to prove from the scriptures they already had. Because some people labored on them and now to finally reap everything you know, and lead them to Christ. And that's what you are to do. You will do it in Jesus' name. I come back now to chapter to chapter uh, 4 and I'm reading from verse 35. In verse 35 here, here is the, the he said, say ye not, or say not ye that yet four months and then cometh the harvest. He said, Why are you slow? Why are you wasting time? Why don't you rise up and tell them? And you're saying it is not time yet. Before you get to that person, the person might die. And you're saying, I don't have time now. I need to finish this business. It, just give me about four months. I'll finish the extra, extra classes I'm going for. Give me four months and then I'll travel and then come back. Then I'll do the work of God. And give me four months. I want to settle my marriage. Once I'm married, then I'll be alright. Give me four months. If I have a child, it will be easy for me. But now I don't have any child. And you're telling me to go and serve the Lord. The people had many reasons why they were waiting. And the Lord said, all those reasons you are waiting will waste the lives of the people that uh, are still waiting for salvation. There's no time to wait. And there's no time to waste. We're going to tell them the word of God in Jesus' name. And then we go to them so that we will reach them with the word of God in Jesus' name. And see what this woman, a single woman, had done. You can do the same. You will do the same. You will sow the word of God into the lives of the people in Jesus. See what others have done. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 4. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. And we're reading from which verse now? Verse 4. Therefore, they that was scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, preaching the word. You don't have to know the whole of Genesis Revelation before you preach the word. If you know only one verse, like, uh, do you know, for God so loved the world, how many of you know that? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How many of us know that? That's gospel. That's gospel. You can tell them that. And uh, Jonah had only one sentence. Uh, Jonah went through Nineveh and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then went to the other corner, yet 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown. And went to the other venue there, the other Christian there, um, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Just that sentence, you know more than that. You know about the love of God. And you know about the faith, we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have been saved. You can tell your testimony and tell them here, and tell them here, and tell them here. You will be an instrument for the salvation of many people in Jesus' name. Give me a jiggle amen now. Look at that verse 4. It says, Therefore, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went, where did they go? Tell me where they went. They went everywhere, everywhere. What, what if we as a church, you look at your community here and then our pastor, local pastor, our pastor, our district pastor, our pastor, our group pastor will say now, we're going to knock at every door in this community. We can do it. We're going to knock at every door. In this a local government, we can do it. And then he pairs us up. And then we go here, we go here. And while we're going, the group pastor himself is going with another person. And then we're reaching everywhere. The men are reaching them. The women are reaching them. Until, well, this will be true about us. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went, tell me, everywhere preaching the word. That's how they did it then. That's how we're going to do it now. We will succeed. You in particular, you will succeed. 
and the lord will bless the word of your mouth to the people in jesus name uh, let me show you something here i'm looking at verse 5 of uh, chapter 8 then philip went down to the city of samaria and preached christ unto them what it says and uh, philip went down to the city of tell me samaria and preach christ unto them i thought all of them were already born again look up here for a moment the city where the woman came from is called Sychar. there were other villages and other towns in samaria that had not been reached and so philip recognized that some people have uh, you know have accepted the gospel have accepted christ in the region of samaria in the locality of Samaria in the local government area of Samaria but it didn't cover everywhere and he recognized that the same thing as we're here maybe as you look at your church here you know we have reached that place we have reached that place you will look at the places who have not reached the same Samaria a city there a village there a community there a street there an avenue there the places we have not reached and then we map everything out we're going to touch everywhere because Jesus died for everyone. And you will not allow Jesus Christ to die in vain. Then Philip went down to, Samir to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. But six, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things uh, which uh, Philip spake, hearing him and seeing the miracles which he did. And then it says, uh, for unclean spirits crying out with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them and many taking with pulses and that were lame tell me were healed verse 8 everybody read verse 8 1 2 3 go and it was a great joy in that city and philip stayed there he was their pastor not just an evangelist. And then they, they came from uh, Jerusalem, that is Peter and uh, John, and ministered to them, uh, and they received a uh, Holy Ghost. Can I show you something here? Uh, look at verse 26. Verse 26 of, of Acts, verse 8. Acts of the Apostle, uh, chapter 8, verse 26. And uh, the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, tell me, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is um, the desert. In verse 27, and tell me, he arose and went. Tell me again. Tell me out loud. He arose and went. Look up here for a moment. Philip was already an evangelist over there in Samaria. And then many, many people in Samaria, they had come to know the Lord. And uh, here we, was a large church there, the whole city. Everybody rejoiced. Revival was there. And that Philip was a pastor over them there. And the angel of the Lord said, leave that place and go and meet one person. Personal evangelism. You know, there are people who are, the, you know, uh, district pastors. When we're going for personal evangelism, they say, I'm a pastor already. Because uh, personal evangelism for them uh, is for the members. And then they say, I'm a group pastor already. I'm an overseer already. And why should I go? Look at what the angel said. To leave that church and then go to this solitary person, individual. And he went. You will go. And he were told in verse 27, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority, under uh, Candace, a queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Look up here for a moment. This is what we are saying. That this person was not totally ignorant. He already had the book, a book of the Old Testament. He had the book of the prophet Isaiah. Other people have sold. And now Philip was coming to reap. The people we are talking to, they are not totally ignorant. They have a literal knowledge. Only that that knowledge has not led them to salvation, to conversion. And except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we're looking at what they have already. And we're coming from what they have already. And we're building on that to lead them to Christ. God will help you. 
They were told in verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And the Philip ran old man, Philip ran. You know some people, once uh, you know they are maybe workers, they are deacons, or they are, they are preach great message in uh, Samaria, and many, many people have come to the Lord. They don't have to run again in the in running errand in the kingdom of God. It's like, you know, they are slow. They are dignified people, honorable people. They are not bishop, or they are pastor, they are this, they are that, but uh, you know, this man, he had the heart of Christ. You have the heart of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. And when duty calls, you will run towards that duty in Jesus' name. And Philip ran thither to him and had him reach the prophet Isaiah. Look at the man. He wasn't born again. But he was not totally ignorant. He was not totally in the dark. He was even reading the word of God aloud. He was a great man. A man of authority. And yet some other people have labored. And they have showed him the importance of the word of God. He was reading aloud. And then Philip said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except a man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and see with him eventually that man was born again the people you are contacting that's how they'll be born again the people you are talking to that's how they'll be born again in jesus name we're coming back now to uh, john chapter 4 we'll come to point number three the samaritan's conversion by the savior the samaritan's conversion by the savior we're coming to john chapter 4 and i'm reading from verse 39 john chapter 4 Verse 39. It says in verse 39, and many of the many of the Samaritans uh, of that city, there are many cities there, but of that particular city believed on him for the saying of the woman, for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. Would you look up for a moment? Peter had not started preaching, but the woman started preaching. Peter had seen Jesus Christ heal his own uh, mother-in-law. He had not started preaching. And uh, this is chapter 4 of John. And then we, you know that uh, the other people, they've seen him walking miracles. He turned water into wine. And then he's done other things too. Because we're told in chapter 2, he performed miracles in Jerusalem. And many believed on him, but he did not commit himself unto them. Peter had seen all that. John had seen all that. And James had seen all that and they were just wondering am i not lucky i'm a disciple i'm a follower i'm following jesus christ but this woman did not wait the little she knew she went into the town and said come see a man that told me everything i ever did is not this the christ and they came and because of what she said they believed a new convert a newly converted woman calling all people like that and they come in and believing women can serve the lord today Sister, give me a good amen. amen. And you know, sometimes they think, uh, we think uh, that it's uh, only they can sing in the choir. Yes, they can. And then they can help us and uh, make the church clean. Yes, they can. And then they can do other things. But you know, they can also evangelize. Sisters, you can evangelize. You will evangelize. I said you will evangelize. See one converted woman, newly converted woman that went to tell everybody and they came. And you know, as we look at the Bible, there was a mage that they had gone, the students had gone to battle and they brought this single mage and there was in the house of Naaman and she saw that Naaman was uh, a leper. And then she opened her mouth, you'll open your mouth. And then told uh, the mistress that uh, if my master will go to Samaria, that uh, the, the prophet there will get him healed. And the mistress told Naaman, and Naaman told the king. And then they wrote a letter through the testimony of that maid, of that uh, little girl. Uh, you know, the mistress knew, Naaman knew, the king knew. And then they had servants that went with Naaman to Samaria to see Elisha. And then 
got uh, that, um, uh, got that healing. And then he came back as the captain of the army, the National Army of Syria, also knew about that miracle. It started from that single lady, that single maid. If it started from her, it will start from you. Do you remember the name Deborah? Because uh, Deborah said Barak. Barak was a man. And he was a man of the army. Uh, over the whole army. And then said uh, go and fight against Sisera. And Barak said if you don't go with me. I will not go. And Deborah said I will go. Deborah influenced one man. Barak. And then Barak went all through the tribes of Israel. And gathered together. 10,000 soldiers of the army. From one woman. Deborah, and then influencing Barak, and that one and influencing 10,000 people. You see, those 10,000 people will trace them back to Deborah because she was a false influence. You don't know where your influence can reach. Talk to one person. I said talk to one person, and then uh, we're going to have the result in Jesus. You remember that uh, Lazarus was sick, and Mary and Martha knew about Jesus Christ because Jesus had visited their home, and he sent to Jesus and said, Jesus, the person whom you love is sick, and eventually he died. And uh, Jesus came over there. There were many people that came to sympathize, understand? It started from Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha. And now, where is she, where is she buried? And Jesus went there, and all those people were there by the influence of Mary and Martha, two sisters. And then Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. What happened? He came forth. You will come forth. The power of God will touch your life in Jesus' name. As a result of that, many people believe. You see, it started, it starts with one person. It starts with two people. It can start with you today. I'm looking at John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And I'm reading from verses 44 and 45. John 11 verses 44 and 45. It says, and he, he that was dead came forth. Everything dead in you will come forth resurrection power will come to your life in jesus name bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin jesus says unto them lose him and let him go you are loosed you are delivered you are set free in jesus name if you believe it it will happen Verse 45, then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did. What happened? Tell me out loud. They believed on him from one person, from two people. Many of these people now, they believe. And that's the same thing that should happen today. If you will not close your mouth, like this woman went out and he told everybody she could see, come see a man that told me all things I ever did. It's not this, the Christ. And you do the same thing uh, through you. Many will come to life eternal. Many will be saved. Many will even become preachers of the word of God. Look at their testimony now. We're coming back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 40. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they, be, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. Look up for a moment. You see, when uh, this woman testified and these people got saved, it, these are not people that say they get saved and they were calling them, come to church. They say, uh, I also have my own church. You had your own church, but you are not born again. I'm also a Christian. You are a Christian, but you didn't know the Lord. But these people, after they knew the Lord, they said, this thing will continue will not allow this one to go. When you have Jesus Christ, when you are truly born again, when life has come to you, you will want to hold on to the Lord until the very end. That's why they said, uh, it should tarry with them. Look at verse 41. And many more, many more, many more believed because of his own word. You know, many had believed already. And then as he touched them and they had yeah, they had him himself. It says many more believed on him. And uh, as we go out to evangelize, and they were influencing people, and we're bringing them to the Lord, many more will believe. 
many more will stay with the Lord. Many more will abide in Jesus' name. We're coming to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 14. Jeremiah chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 14. We're looking at verse 8. It says, Oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior, the hope of Israel, the Savior. It says, Thereof in time, the Savior thereof in time of trouble. Why shouldest thou be as a stranger in the land? And as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night. It says he was the savior. And yet, before this time, it was like a stranger to them. But now that they knew him, they said, why will you stay outside for a night? Stay with us. Abide with us. And you know, they provided accommodation for Jesus. Accommodation for all those uh, disciples of Jesus. And they stayed there and they started teaching uh, the people. Uh, you know, some of us who are here now as we get people to know the Lord and then many people come to know the Lord and we're seeing that they're all new converts and there is uh, no land and there is no house we would have uh, had a church there and then follow up on the people and be teaching the people, discipling the people what do you mean there's no land there? How about all those people? What do you mean there's no accommodation there? How about all those people? Oh, they are new converts. And because they are new converts, we cannot take anything from them yet. But look at Jesus. It's all these new converts that they should tarry with them. And they accommodated him and he accepted. Are you better than Jesus? I can't hear my people. Are you greater than Jesus? He, they, they accommodated him and he accepted and they gave him food for those two days and then all these disciples too and some people will say we're not going to take anything from them they have come to the Lord and we're ministering to them and whatever they serve we're going to take and this church will continue to grow if they have land let them give the land if they have houses let them supply the houses and then the work of God will go on through us and through you through me in Jesus name We've seen the woman. We've seen what she did. And we've seen the many people that came to know the Lord. Let me show you a man before we conclude. We're looking at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 38. Luke chapter 8. We're looking at verse 38. In verse 38 it says, Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. And But Jesus sent him away and saying, Return to thine own house and show how great things God has done unto thee. Here was a new convert to you, newly delivered, newly set free from all the shackles and the chains of an evil spirit. And then she, he wanted to follow Jesus because this is so sweet. This salvation is so wonderful. I will never leave you now. And Jesus said, go back home and show what great things the Lord has done for thee. And he went his way and he publicized, tell me, and he publicized, tell me out loud. Throughout the whole city, how great things Jesus had done unto him. Tell what you know. Tell them your experience. It's giving you peace. It's giving you joy. It's giving you salvation. And you have forgiveness. You have justification. You have an assurance within you that if you die today, you're going to heaven because Jesus died for you. I was religious. I didn't know that before. I read the Bible. I didn't know that before. But now Christ has come to me and I am saved. And when the man told them, look at verse 40, and it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. Look at what one man has done over here. Look at what one woman has done over here. In John chapter 4, the story of the woman that went to the old city and told them all that Jesus Christ had done for her. And she brought many people to the Lord. In Luke chapter 8, the story of a man that went throughout the whole city, another city, and said what Jesus had done for him. And they all believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The baton is now in your hand. The opportunity is now with you. And the chance is now for you to go back home and tell everybody. Tell them your testimony. Tell them what the Lord has done. And tell them what Jesus Christ will do for them. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as they call, they'll be saved. 
as you tell them about Jesus and they call on him, they will be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. You will bear fruit. Amen. You will have converts. Amen. You bring people to the Lord. You will start somewhere. You will start with somebody. You will open your mouth and the Lord will fill your mouth in Jesus' name. You will do it. What are you? I said you will do it. What are you? I said you will do it. Why don't you stand up and tell the Lord, Lord, I will do it. Help me. Help me. You help that woman and she broadcast it everywhere. Come see a man that told me everything I ever did. It's not this the Christ. And you help this man too. And you told the whole city, throughout the whole city. And it happened. It's going to happen through you. It's going to happen through you. You were born to reproduce. And you were born so that you can tell other people and other people through you will be saved. You are going to be free. Fruitful. Be faithful, you'll be fruitful. Be faithful, you will be fruitful. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.